Hey, YouTubers, I am your host, Tony Merkel, and I want to let you know that we are a podcast first, which means we upload our shows to YouTube. If you really like the show and you want to hear it on the go, whether you're at the gym or in the car driving around, go to iTunes and hit subscribe. And if you're not on iTunes, no problem. Go to iHeartRadio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player, hit subscribe, and you can listen to us that way as well. So I hope you guys enjoy the show. Let's get to it. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel, and thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me that email. My email address is theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. That's theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the connection section, and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. So I want to let everybody know that we are moving our platform from Blog Talk Radio to Revolver Podcast. I'm very excited about this move. It's going to be a great move for the show, more exposure, including things like we're going to be put on iHeartRadio, Spotify, and other platforms that we didn't have access to before as well. So I'm really excited about it. And I just want to let everybody know we are on Revolver Podcast as of right now. And I'm very excited about it. Now, moving on to the Art Bell iTunes five star rating and reviews, we have Zontan, Trail Hugger, Michael D. The Aggie, Sophie W, Cowboy 214668, and he says Sasquatch Chronicles is better. And I'm thinking that sounds a little bit like an undercover agent named Wes Germer. Then we have Sergeant Kamikaze, Kristen RB143, Postman RR4, I Rock Devo from Canada, and Koba19 from Australia. Thank you very much for going to iTunes and leaving that five star rating and review. It really does help the show out a lot. I say it every week, but I never get tired of saying it because it's so true. Thank you very much for doing that. I appreciate it a lot. Now, moving on here, we have our monthly live patrons only episode coming up tomorrow. August 26, 2018 at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to have access to this show, go to patreon.com forward slash the confessionals to sign up to become a patron and you'll have access to tomorrow's show. And tomorrow's show, we're bringing back on Ryan from episode 78, Abducted with Lost Time. And not only Ryan, but two other people who said they shared similar experiences as Ryan did. So they're all going to come on. We're all going to talk about it. It's going to be a great time. You're not going to want to miss it. So go to patreon.com forward slash the confessionals to sign up to become a patron to get exclusive access to tomorrow's show. Now, this past week, we had two people sign up as patrons, Jeff O and William L. And I really appreciate it, guys, for going ahead and signing up to become patrons. You'll have exclusive access tomorrow to that show that we're going to be doing for you as patrons only. Now, this week, we have Scott coming on. And Scott actually was raised with a mother who dabbled with the occult. And he talks about his paranormal experiences that he had when he was a kid. And as he got older, became a Christian and now does overseas missions trips. And he talks about a lot of the supernatural and paranormal things that he has seen overseas. Today's going to be a great great show so sit back and relax and we're going to get into it right after this all right tonight i have a good guest coming on scott and scott how you doing man man i'm doing good thank you for having me on the show Absolutely, man. So I got your email, I think it was just a few weeks ago, actually. And I wanted to bump you up in the schedule of recording just because I know with what you do with traveling with missions and things like that, you know, it's it's going to be hard for you to plan out months in advance to uh, come on the show and get interviewed. Uh, so I wanted to, you know, bump you up to now. And I'm glad we did because you got some good information to share with people about your experiences. And it all kind of starts with you as a kid being raised by your mom and your mom dabbling in the occult and things like that. So why don't you just kind of walk us into, you know, how that whole environment was and, you know, what had happened? Yeah, no problem. I appreciate, again, like I said, I appreciate you having me on the show. Um, yeah, I, uh, my mom, um, and my dad, my dad recently passed away in November. Um, but my mom and dad, they were, they were great people. And my mom just had a real, um, interest in, um, the occult, I guess you'd say. Um, she was really into psychic affairs and um, Ouija boards and um, 
we're just constantly watching scary shows, talking about ghost stories, things that happen, um, like to her family and, and, and things like that. And so as a, as a child, you know, from like, I don't know, seven to roughly 10, um, 11, 12 years old, this is, this is, this is a normal thing. You know, it was just a, a constant um, thing. It's not like she, she drank blood or anything weird like that or did any sacrifices, <laughs> but she was just into that stuff big time. I remember one time we went to a, uh, a psychic fair here in, here in town and it was um, at a hotel somewhere over by the airport. And, and there was just a lot of different people there, you know, with crystals and all the different things you'd see and stuff like that. Um, and I went and, and, and it was just kind of a weird experience as a kid. Um, but, but her experience is kind of flowed into the house I was raised in. Um, we bought this house when I was about four years old over in, um, there's an old part of Tulsa called Red Fork. And, um, Red Fork is like one of the first communities, um, that Tulsa, um, that was started in the Tulsa area. And Tulsa was a oil town. I mean, that's, that's why we were founded was because of oil. But, um, the house that we, I grew up in was uh, in Red Fork. And it was one of the oldest houses in Red Fork. And this particular house started, um, as a one room shack. And, um, the stories that I've heard, I can't confirm. Um, these stories, but some of the things I've heard is that um, it was uh, there's a there was a railroad track just a couple blocks from the house, and and some people said it was a place where the guys that were working on the railroad road would come and uh, stay, and then other people said um, it was a house that the um, like the oil workers in the beginning when they struck oil in Red Fork they would stay there, but regardless, it was a it, you could see, like, like when you went into the attic of this house, you could see the original roof, and the rest of the house was built around this house. And you could see a little chimney coming out of the roof um, when you're in the attic. So the house, over the years, had had many rooms built around it, and um, it was just a really old house. And um, when um, my, mom, my mom and dad got ready to sell that house in 03, we had it from like 70-something to 03. Um, one of the things they had to do was replace the dining room floor and, um, they were tearing up the floor and, um, my brother calls me and he's like, Hey, you got to come over here, man. Um, and I was like, why? He said, just come over here now. And so I go there and, um, it was a crawl space house. And so he said, go over, um, there was a living room and you went into this hallway and he said, go into that hallway. And I was just walking on the rafters, looking down at the ground, you know, it's like, probably two or three feet, I don't know, from um, where the floor was to the ground. As I got closer to this hallway, there were stairs. And I'm like, what in the world? And he goes, go down there. And I go, I ain't going down there. He goes, go down there. I went down there. And I said, okay, okay. My little brother can, I can. And so I go between the rafters and I go down these stairs. And um, you went down probably about eight feet. And it kind of turned into this big oval cement room. Um, and this room was just full of crickets. I mean, I remember there was crickets all over the place, but there were also little medicine bottles, like little, um, um, like from the turn of last century, you know, you'd see in glass, Clorox, Clorox bottles to, um, like bleach bottles. We could see some of those. And, um, anyway, they wound up covering it up, selling the house. And I'm going to come back to that here in a minute. Cause I have kind of okay. a theory about that room, but I don't know if it was like a, root cellar, you know, where they kept stuff underground when it was an original one-room shack. I don't know. But um, anyway, in this old house, there was a lot of strange things that would happen. I mean, you would... My mom had things happen. Um, one particular story I can think of for my mom is that um, it was right around 4th of July. Um, she was in her, in her room um, sleeping. And I guess my dad had went to work or something like that. But she said a, a guy came into her room and, and this guy was, it was like, it was like, the, like, dull. it was like, you know, it's still kind of dark, but the light started to come into the room from the sun. And this guy comes into the room and she said she turned and she didn't get a weird feeling from him. She just felt like it was, she felt like it was one of her uncles who had passed on many years before. 
but she couldn't really, she said he kind of had like a trench coat. You couldn't really see an outline. It wasn't like a complete black mass or anything like that. And she said, the guy told her, he goes, you know, Bob is going to have heart attacks. Now, Bob was my step grandfather. And, um, at the time, and, um, anyway, she said it was not a scary thing. It was just one of those things. And, and she just went about her business. She told my dad. And, and anyway, about a week later, uh, my step grandfather did indeed have a heart attack. He lived through that one, but, um, just things like that. Um, something that happened to me in the house is I was probably about six years old and, you know, you can chalk this up to being a kid or whatever, but, um, I was, uh, laying in bed, laying in bed one night and it was probably about three or four in the morning. Um, and I was just kind of, you know, woke, woke up and me and my little brother used to sleep in the, it was a two room house. And, uh, me and my uh, brother, who's two years younger than me, we'd share that room. And, and I remember waking up and just kind of looking towards the door that went down the hallway into the kitchen. And as I was looking at this door, I could see this, this lady, um, you could see some features. I mean, I could see her hair. She had longer hair. It was more of a, um, she was wearing kind of like a night. I don't know if it was a nightgown or what, but she kind of had like, um, it's almost like a sash, um, was, was, was around her, her chest area. And I just remember absolutely freaking out. You know, I saw her, I took off screaming and I, I remember running right through her. I remember as I was running through her and I remember looking back and I could see her kind of turn. And anyway, after that, I didn't catch any sign of her and I ran straight to my uh, mom and dad's room screaming. I mean, it just caused emotion and, and I wound up sleeping in, in that room that night with my dad and my mom went and slept with my little brother because I had completely um, just freaked everybody out that night. Um, but that was one incident that happened in that house. Um, another incident that happened, my dad um, was very skeptical. He's a very skeptical, he was a very skeptical guy and and he uh, he didn't take any of the stuff my mom talked about serious at all. I mean, he would laugh about it, joke about it and that kind of thing. Well, there was an incident that happened um, to him that I found out in 03 when they were covering up that um, room I was talking about earlier in the story. And there was one night when he was um, going into the bedroom to go to bed, and he, he walked into the room, stepped back out, and then walked back into the room and, and got into bed. And my mom was in bed. She said, why did you do that? And he was kind of startled. And he said that there was a lady. He thought it was my mom. My dad had pretty bad eyesight. But he thought it was my mom. And he walked, stepped out so she, so she could pass and go to the bathroom. And he watched her walk down the hallway and disappear around the, around the corner. And then he um, went back into the room. Well, later on, my dad said that it quite the coincidence that that room under the house was directly in that same area where um, he saw that lady that night. And so wow. for him, it was, it was kind of weird. So um, my mom, like I said, she experienced a lot of things. Um, I don't know if it was just because she opened doors with the occult or whatever, but um, she did have an experience. And I remember she told me about, um, my little brother, my other little brother, there's three of us, three boys. Um, he was about nine years younger than me. But one day she was doing dishes in the kitchen, and she said she could hear my little brother in the living room just talking away to somebody. And um, he came bounding into the uh, dining room, which was open to the kitchen there, and, and she had her back to him, and, and she, she just uh, turned around, and she turned around, she saw this big figure behind my little brother and she said she kind of looked straight ahead again and turned back around and, and it was gone. Wow. So, um, she had that experience in that house. Um, one thing that me and my brother, who's two years younger than me, we still talk about because nobody else in the family remembers but us. We used to go to my aunt uncle's every um, Saturday night, all the, my mom's brothers and sisters would 
meet together and and all the grown ups and hang out and all the kids would go play. And one Saturday night we, we went to, to my aunt's house and, and we came back. We'd usually come back about midnight. And I remember me and my, my brother, we go into that bedroom um, where we stayed and there was, you know, a, it was, it was an antibiotic, amoxicillin, you know, that antibiotic that kids take when they're sick and stuff like that. Yeah. There was a, a bottle of it in the, in the, in our room. And anyway, when we got home, there was medicine splashed all over the wall, like in a pretty particular line. It was really weird. It was almost like it was, there was writing or tried, somebody tried to do something with writing or musical notes. It wasn't just like splashes. It was like, it was like it was intentional. And I remember me and my, um, my brother were just like freaked out because of that situation. And, and like I said, nobody else in the family remembers that happening at all, <laughs> except for me and him. And um, anyway, that was, that was pretty strange. And, and I don't know if something was trying to communicate or I don't know. It, it was just a, a really strange situation. Yeah. Especially, especially looking back at it with, you know, hindsight, knowing that you found that room underneath with all those like medicine bottles and things like that. It's kind of weird, you know? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, there was one more incident in that house that happened. Um, I was probably about 12 years old. My uh, other little brother was about 10 and uh, my, my littlest brother was two. And um, we were staying, um, you know, mom would just say, watch your little brother while I work during the day. It wasn't a big deal. That was just, you know, I was part of it back then. And um, one day, it was the afternoon, and we were watching TV in the living room, and all of a sudden, we heard all this commotion um, in the room, um, in, in our room, towards the back of the house. And it sounded like things were falling and banging. And keep in mind, we didn't have any pets at all. We had no dogs. We had no cats inside the house. And anyway, I thought it was an intruder. I didn't know. So I took off. We all took off out the uh, front door and um, went across the street to a friend's house. And his mom was there, but she was older. It was actually, I think his grandma that, that took care of him, but um, there wasn't much she could do for us. But um, anyway, we, uh, we went, went across the street. And, and as we were there, it was like you could, you know, we looked across the street and we were probably about 25 yards from the house. And there was a big picture window in the front. And you could see like the outline of something. It was like a, like a, like a, it was almost like it was a, a somebody was just looking with their head, like, uh, um, you know, how like a snob looking, you know, um, from their nose, like, like from their nose, you know, they're looking down at you, that kind of thing. Yeah. And we could kind of see that kind of a, a shadowy looking figure um, in the window. And, and then it was gone. And I, I remember all of us saw it. And um, later on, we had the neighbor, um, when he got home, my next door neighbor, he, uh, he went through the house for us. And there was a ton of stuff that had fallen off the shelf um, in our bedroom. And I don't know. I don't, I didn't, it didn't look like anybody came through the back door. Um, it just looked like stuff fell off the shelf for some reason. And, and so anyway, that was... Um, that's pretty intense for us as little kids. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, with that with that story that you just shared and stuff. I mean, what's the chances of somebody you know intruding into your house just to knock things off the shelf and not steal anything? Exactly. I mean, nothing was stolen, right? No, they just knock stuff off this these, these, these shelves on the wall. That's it. That's all they did, okay. or all whatever did. Um, and like I said, we had no pets inside the house at all. We had no no animals at all. So, um, but anyway, moving on, I was probably junior high, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there. And, you know, mom would leave for the day to work and dad worked and, and our house just became like a magnet for everybody to come to and just to get freaked out because they knew stories about what I'd tell them about what my mom would tell me and, and things like that. So I remember being a kid. And having all these kids in the neighborhood and they'd want to do like seances and stuff in the house. And, wow. And, and I remember just freaking them out. You know, I don't remember anything like weird happening at that moment, but it was just because of, 
all that had happened before that I would tell them about my mom's stories and stuff. So they all wanted to come over to the house and get freaked out and that kind of thing. Um, like I said, I would just, I would just joke around many times. Um, but anyway, sometime in that time frame, my, my, my mom wound up making her own Ouija board. And what she did was she found like an old piece of wood and then she had like a wood burning, um, kit of some kind, you know, the, the knife or whatever it is. And so she burned the letters and the numbers and all that, like you'd see on like one of the game things you could buy in the toy store type Ouija board, but she made her own. And, um, when the Ouija board entered the picture and I got into like my early teens, that's when things just really started to change. Um, it went, for, it went to a, a, a different type level. And so I remember all my friends would come over and we'd play with the Ouija board and, and things like that. And, you know, for a long time, nothing really happened. I mean, it was just a bunch of kids that would freak each other out and, and, and just play around with it like that. Um, but then it just slowly started changing. And I remember it became more of like a, like an obsession. You know what I mean? It became kind of a, just a darkness type situation that just, I had to do it all the time. And my cousins, there were some particular cousins that I had on my mom's side that were into it too. And, and we were all guys. Um, but I remember one fourth of July, we were at an aunt's house, um, you know, celebrating fourth of July and, and we had brought the Ouija board over. Cause like I said, some of them were into it. I had a couple of, um, I had one uncle that was a, a Christian and he wouldn't go anywhere near it. Um, but I remember we were in this back bedroom and um, we were playing on this Ouija board and um, there was like, a, you know, there was probably five or six of us teenagers around it. And even our parents were, were peering in, watching. And, and I remember um, my dad was there. And like I said before, my dad was pretty skeptical of, of that kind of stuff. But, we were playing around and it was just doing the same old thing, you know, just, just answering little things here and there. And at one point we asked um, the name and she said her name was Anna. And we just started communicating with her. And I remember my dad walked into the room and this Ouija board started going nuts. I mean, it was like freaking out, like spelling all kinds of curse words and, and just all kinds of stuff. And I remember it finally kind of went, got, we, it felt like we got control of it, but it's like it calmed down a little bit. And we asked it, asked the, the, the board, we're like, what's going on? You know, what, what happened? And she goes, he killed my sister. And we're like, what? And then she just started, she, she started naming cities in Vietnam. And we were like, you know, cities we couldn't even name. And, and, and I remember looking at my dad and he just kind of laughed and walked out of the room. And my dad was a Vietnam vet. And there was some situations. My dad won the uh, Silver Star, which at the time was the second highest you could win um, because of some of the things he had to do as far as protecting. One time his carrier group got um, ambushed and he wound up having to get on top of the, the big in whatever gun it was on top. And he killed tons of people to, to, that were coming on them. And so I don't in any way think my dad intentionally killed anybody as far as a, a kid or anything like that. But this Ouija board that day just flipped out. And like I said, it was naming cities in Vietnam where, where they lived and, and things like that. And, and it just, it just got really weird. Um, that day. And I just, like I said, my dad was very skeptical. And I remember looking at his face and I think some of the cities I never even asked him later. I didn't say, dad, is that a city you were in or anything like that? But you could tell he was pretty, pretty shaken um, when that happened that day. And um, anyway, with that, do you think that your dad had a, I guess a guilty conscience with that. Do you think that's why it freaked him out as, so much? Or do you think maybe he had, I don't know, something more personal happen over there that kind of freaked him out because this thing said it like that. 
I think it was the fact that I don't think my dad had a guilty conscience for what he had to do over there because I thought when he passed away, a lot of his, um, his uh, Vietnam brothers that were in his little group came down from Massachusetts and Michigan and from all over the country to, to go to my dad's funeral. And talking to them, they just had to do what they had to do. I don't think my dad had a guilt. Maybe he felt um, guilty because of the, some of the stuff they had to do when they were there. Um, I don't. I think what probably freaked him out was the fact that this board was naming cities in Vietnam. Yeah, you know, we I didn't I didn't know any cities in Vietnam, and you know, back then there was no internet. I couldn't Google Vietnam cities. You know, you had to go to a globe or a map or the library or something like that. So it wasn't like any of us knew where he was at. And like I said, I never went back and asked him, Dad, were you really in the city or anything like that? And so anyway, it was, it was a pretty strange, strange incident. Yeah, for sure. Um, but like I said earlier, the, the, it was like we, we, I had personally opened the door, um, with this Ouija board because it got to the point where, to be honest with you, I didn't even need the Ouija board to know the answers to the question. Um, I could watch kids playing with the Ouija board across the room, and I knew like they would ask, what's the next car coming up or who's going to call on the phone next? And it was almost like I, at that point, I would even know the answer. And it just got really, really dark. And we were at my uh, friend's house um, playing with the Ouija board. And we had been playing it pretty regularly for probably about, I don't know, 30 to 45, 60 days. I don't know how long it was. But um, we were playing with it, and it started naming off this this thing called Slucifer, okay? At that point, things got really dark for me. When Slucifer entered the scene, now here's my theory about the whole thing. I don't think... There was a girl named Anna. I don't think there was any of those other things that we were supposedly contacting, any other names. I think it was all this particular demonic presence. Because I don't think, you know, I don't think that 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 Anna girl was even a girl from Vietnam. Because I think, you know, demons can see things. They, 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 they're with us. They watch us. They know people better than we know ourselves. And so they know information about things that we don't. And so I think this Lucifer character was, was literally behind it all. And once he made his presence known on the, on the Ouija board, that's when things for me personally, that started getting really dark in my life. Um, I remember I was, and, and I wasn't raised in a Christian home at all um, growing up, but I had a pull. I remember talking to my cousin, and we were, like, talking, and I was like, man, I'd like to get a satanic Bible. And he was like, yeah, me too. And we were both playing with the Ouija board. And I said, I don't really believe in it. I just want to look at it and, and start, you know, just see what it's about and that kind of thing. I remember my music, you know, and I'm not dogging anybody's music, okay? I'm not saying music makes me evil. But some of the lyrics in, like, a band like Slayer, uh, that kind of stuff, that, that lyric that I was listening to. And I remember going into my room and just put my headphones on and just listening for hours, that same stuff over and over. And um, it just got really dark. Um, I remember one particular um, day I was getting ready to go to my friend's house. And I went um, to go get one of my shoes. And I remember as I was reaching down for my shoe, it just like moved. Like, 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 not like across the room and hit the wall or anything, but I remember it just like moved like a foot away from where I was. And so, and then I remember it, I mean, it didn't even really freak me out. It was almost like I was feeling something natural happen. I can't even explain it. It was just like something, something was becoming a part of me. That's, that's the only way I can explain it. And, um, I remember seeing one, I remember I used to see like these dark shadows and, in my room at night. And, and I don't, you know, there was no particular story. I remember waking up one night and seeing it over me and it's not like it talked to me or anything like that. Um, but it was just, it just got really, really dark, um, for about three years. 
And so for a while, it was just like really dark, dark, dark times. And, you know, I don't even, as I got into my late teens, I don't even remember when all that ended. Like, like it's not like all of a sudden the darkness just ended. It just kind of faded out for a while. Because I didn't play with Ouija boards when I was like 17 or, or 18 years old. I was, wasn't really into the occult. I was more into just partying and, and, and girls and, and things like that. So I don't really remember when it all ended. Um, um, and I think it was just because life kind of got in the way. You know what I mean? I just kind of started living a later teen life, junior, senior in high school. And I just, you know, could drive and things like that. Uh, but during that time, I still, man, I had no moral compass. And to be honest with you, I don't think that door was ever shut that I opened earlier with the Ouija board and stuff like that. So I, I think it was still with me, um, just staying back in the shadows. And I'll talk more about some things that happened later. Um, but I had no moral compass. When I was a senior, I wound up getting my girlfriend pregnant in high school, and she was a junior. And we had two daughters together. And um, anyway, about four and a half years later, that, that marriage ended. But there's some things that happened during that marriage that I'd, I'd like to talk about, too. Because part of what I believe is associated with my mom and her into the occult and all that stuff, and then me later. And I'll tell some stories here in a minute about my daughter. I think it was, I think there's something like attached to our family line. I think there's like generational type. I don't know if you, I'm not calling them curses. I think they're demonic entities that just hang around. You know what I mean? They just kind of hang from mom to, you know, you see people that are just stuck in these same cycles. And, and I just think that's, that's what was going on. And, and it attached to my oldest daughter. Um, when she was, we were living in that same house I grew up in. We bought it off, my, or we rented it off my mom and dad um, when we, we got married and stuff. And, and um, my oldest daughter, um, I remember I'd come home or be on the phone with my wife, and she's like, hey, um, Jessica's got a new friend named Grandpa Lop Lop. And she talked to Grandpa Lop Lop all the time. And she could, she would just get really weird with it. Like she would just stare straight ahead. Like she was talking to them. It wasn't like they were having a tea party or anything. It was, it was like they were like, she was having some kind of weird conversation with somebody and it would be like mumbling and whispering and, and things like that. And so she just kept having this, the same imaginary friend or whatever named grandpa Lop Lop. Um, one Memorial Day weekend, we were going to um, visit my, my first wife. Her, her little brother died when he, when he was six. Um, he died because a drunk driver hit him um, in the road. And so he was buried in this graveyard. And we were going to go meet her mom and dad at this graveyard and put flowers on his grave. And I remember we couldn't find his grave. And my little daughter, she was probably about three at the time. She was in the back seat talking, like usual, to Grandpa Lop Lop. And she goes, I remember being here. I remember all you guys were over there, and, and I was over there. And she was pointing right where his grave was. And I remember looking at my wife, and I was just like, and she's like, we went there, and that's where everybody was. And so it was like I, she was picking up on something. And, and so anyway, she was. She was picking up on something, and my, my, my first wife's dad was really, I don't know how this gets connected with, with me as a young, young adult, but her dad was in tarot cards and, and all that stuff, and, and he used to just play around with them and, and things like that, and one night, he got freaked out, and I remember he, the next day, he called, us, we were going to pick her up, my daughter, because she had stayed the night there. And he called us and told us to come get her and we came to get her. And, and he was freaked out because she was talking about Grandpa Lop Lop. She was looking. She kept saying there's something. She was saying there was something in the corners and things like that. And he said just a look in her face that, that ew, something was going on. And so anyway, 
you know, there's nothing anymore attached to her. She's 26 now. Um, and, and anyway, it's just a, a really strange thing to happen for like the first probably four years of her life. This is Forrest and Scott from Astonishing Legends. And when we're not hunting down ghosts, cryptids, and mysteries, we're listening to The Confessionals with Tony Merkel. I often wonder sometimes when people, you know, talk about their kids or somebody's kids or their siblings having imaginary friends, sometimes I wonder, is it imaginary? Like, or is it something where, you know, people who don't believe in ghosts, people who, you know, just are, don't think along the lines that I personally think and most of the people that are listening to this show tend to think. Is it something maybe a little different than that? I mean, I'm sure there's imaginary friends and things like that, but sometimes I wonder, is it imaginary friends? You know, because <laughs> it's like, yeah. I, I, I know I keep just repeating myself, but it's like, it could be. But maybe it's yeah. not, you know, <laughs> maybe it's yeah. not. Uh, my sister yeah. had many imaginary friends as a little girl growing up. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I tend to think that they were imaginary friends, but you never know. Maybe one of these days I'll ask her, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and here's here's kind of my view on it. You know, I want to get a divorce from her in like four years after we got married and, and I got remarried. I've been married to my wife now for 21 years and life's been really good, but I became a Christian in 1997. And here's, here's kind of what I believe. I believe some of us have certain spiritual gifting from what I read in scripture, call it discernment, call it whatever you want. And maybe it's in the DNA, maybe it's genetic. I don't know. But do I believe my daughter was reincarnated? I don't personally believe that because she was talking about being in a grave where that little boy was. You know, that's what through my mind. But I believe maybe she had that thing, you know, that discernment type gifting. And I'll give you an example because here's the thing with the discernment, in my opinion. You can use it for good or you can use it for bad. I used mine for bad for a long time when I was, when I was younger. And I picked up on things and I could tell things and I could perceive things. And, and, you know, I think something was using me through that, but here's a situation that happened um, probably about 12, 13 years ago. I was watching a movie in the living room with my wife. I'd been a Christian for probably, I don't know, seven years or something like that. And I'm watching a movie and all of a sudden I felt this pull inside me, go outside and pray, go outside and pray. And that never happened. And I remember going outside and praying. And during this time, I was just trying to find a place in the church to volunteer. You know, God, what's your ministry for me? And I was just praying that prayer a lot. And I remember going outside and praying. And, and all of a sudden, I started thinking about, like, hospice and, and death and dying and things like that. And it wasn't, like, weird or anything. It was just, like, a good message of that kind of stuff. And I thought, you know, I'm the kind of personality type. I go guns to blaze in that direction. I don't, like, it's just, like, you know, ready, fire, aim type, type deal. Yeah. And so I just start thinking the whole next week, I'm going into hospice ministry. I'm going to start helping people go through that process. And I go to the library and I'm getting all the books I can. And anyway, about a week later, um, one of my cousins drowned. And so during that time, it was very beneficial to know the information I knew before, because I was able to use some of that stuff that, that I learned about reading and things to help my own family through that process. So, you know, I think it's a gifting that you can use it either way. You can either let the dark darkness use you, or you can let the, you know, God and, 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 and the good part of it use you, you know? And anyway, um, I think that was just, a, I think it's been attached to my family um, for years. And, you know, we, we, we did have an enemy. <laughs> my belief system is that we are, you know, the Bible talks about our struggles not against flesh and blood, um, but against rulers and authorities and powers of, of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil. 
in the heavenly realms. And, and I'm not preaching or anything, but from the experiences I had when I was young to what I've seen now, I believe that 100%. And so I think there has been a personality gifting throughout my family. I don't know how far it goes back into the generations on my mom's side. But a lot of them, I don't think, used it for the right, to the right side of the battle. You know what I mean? And so, right. um, you know, I just believe there's some doors um, that's been attached. You know, you can just open those doors, and there's been some darkness that's been attached to my family um, for years. And here's here's where I'm at in it, because I've had some incidences happen since I became a Christian. I can get enthralled with the ghost shows, like ghost hunters, when it was big, with uh, the two guys from Roto Rooter or whatever. Taps. I was into it. Huh? Taps. Yeah, 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 taps. But I was into it big time to where I would just, once I started watching it, I just had to watch it constantly, okay? Every time it came on, I didn't even have Netflix at the time. But every time it came on, I had to watch it. Every week, I was just enthralled by it. And I just got into it big time to where it kind of kind of took over in a way. And um, I remember one, one evening, me and my wife were eating dinner and a couple of my, you know, we had five kids together. And a couple of them were eating dinner. And, and my son was probably about nine or ten at the time. He went to go. This is a different house, by the way. This isn't the one I was raised in. But he went to go take a shower. And so I remember watching him walk towards the, uh, the the door to the hallway. And as he walked around the hallway, it was like I saw like a, a figure of light, like 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 parallel to him from my angle, like behind him, walking with him. And I remember thinking to myself, well, what's probably happened is you know when you glance to your side, you see like a shadow go by and you, a person or something, you know, like the trail of a person. I thought, well, who's that? And as I looked across the table at my wife, she was like, had her mouth wide open. And I looked at her and I said, did you see that? And she goes, she just shook her head and she said, yeah. And I was a Christian at the time. And in my mind, I thought, man, it was, it was light. It wasn't dark. It was, it was good. And that's when I told my wife, that, that's the story I told her. And about a week later, me and my brother, we were moving furniture. Um, he was moving into a new apartment. And I remember telling him the story, and he was a believer, too, in Christ. And, and he looked at me, and he said, Brother, you better pray right now and shut that door. And as soon as he said that, I thought, Oh, my gosh. I've opened that door again. And, and, and it wasn't like an angel of light. It was like something masquerading itself. And so, I, you know, I went back and I prayed and I asked God to forgive me and I repented of what I had done and renounced the works of the devil and I shut that door. And, and nothing happened after that, like that, until a few years later. And once again, I opened that door, um, usually through those shows, um, watching whatever, you know, I just started. And, and it's not like a, I can watch a scary movie and be fine. But it becomes like a like an obsession. I can't explain it. I can watch it one. It's like almost like an alcoholic. You know, you could take one drink and be fine. But then there's times when somebody just goes nuts with alcohol, and and that's kind of how I am with those shows. Sometimes I don't think there's you know anything wrong with them, but for me, it, it's just it's crazy. But anyway, a few years later, I find myself again watching those shows over and over, and um, one night. I went to bed before my wife, and I was laying in bed, and I was kind of drifting off, and I felt something beside me in the bed, like something had indented the bed. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I must just be in that sleep, in between wake sleep state, and it was just my imagination. I was so tired, I just kind of caught back out, or tried to conk out. And then about 30 seconds later, my wife comes running in the room, and She's like, did you, did you see something? And I'm like, what, what? And she said, she was, she was watching TV and the TV sat on the same wall as the hallway door did to go back towards our bedroom. 
And she was watching TV, and it was like at night, all the lights are off, and she's watching TV. And she said she saw a dark, shadowy figure look around the corner and then go back towards where I was in the bedroom. And I didn't tell her that night what had actually happened to me. I didn't tell her until I had, again, you know, prayed, asked God, you know, forgive me. I shut this door. And, um, Anyway, then I told her, and, you know, I firmly believe what sat beside me that night was that dark, shadowy figure that she saw. You know, it was always, and my wife's pretty skeptical about that stuff, too. Um, she's she's kind of like my dad in that respect. So whenever anything kind of kind of corroborated, gathered, you know, the evidence, I'm like, man, this isn't just my imagination. Um, there's something else to this. And once again, you know, I had to open the door and it, here's what I believe. Okay. I believe there's a presence that's always watching. It's watching me and it can't do anything as long as I'm, you know, not opening that particular door. But as soon as I give it the opportunity, when I open that door, it's almost like I give it the right to come in and, and, and so I believe it's watching me all the time, waiting for that opportunity to come right back in. And so I have to be very vigilant to, uh, to keep that door shut. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people, they have different triggers. Uh, like you mentioned about the alcoholics, you know, al- alcoholics, they have triggers. Uh, drug addicts have triggers. And I think when it comes to this kind of stuff, I think there are certain triggers that trigger this kind of activity in people's lives. Because, I mean, I, I don't think that watching those shows for everybody has the same effects as it has for you uh or else we hear about it more right but uh I, i definitely hear what you're saying and because I feel the same way about my own life. Uh, what you said really mirrors me. Uh, when I was living in the apartments, especially before we bought our house, you know, three or four years ago, uh, I watched a ton of those ghost shows. And that seemed to be right around the time that I started seeing shadow figures crossing across my hallway and things like that. And, you know, I, I was, I was too stubborn to make a change in my habits. I loved the show. So I was like, well, whatever, you know, but yeah, yeah. I, I definitely no, I, think that there could be triggers. Uh, and I think there's definitely certain triggers for uh, everybody comes from different aspects of life and they have different stories, uh, uh, not stories, but life stories, you know, they all have different backgrounds yeah. and there's certain things that trigger for them more than other people, you know? Yeah. And I don't want to make anybody feel bad or anything like that. But like you said, it, a trigger is a great word because for me, it was such a, a big, part of my young life that, you know, it, it just had such an influence on me that now I got to really be careful because I, you know, I did open something up back then and, and it just, that is a trigger for me. And it doesn't, it's not just, like I said, I can watch a scary show from time to time or, or whatever. And I'm fine. But there are those times when I just become obsessed with it, like crazy obsessed. And, and it just, it just opens the door to something that, that I don't, I don't want in my life. You know, I don't want it running behind my my little boy. You know that 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 makes me feel responsible for opening that door. I don't want it messing with my family um, in any way. So, um, anyway, one of the other things that 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 I do is go on these mission trips around around the world, and I go to places. Um, uh, yeah, pretty dark places. Um, India is one of the places I go to, and it's, um, I love the people of India, but it's a pretty poverty stricken place full of all kinds of idol, um, idolatry and all kinds of, it's just disease and, and poverty, and it's just really, really rough. But I know for me personally, when, when I get off that plane in China or India or wherever I am, I feel the oppression, man. I feel like things are are not wanting me there um, when I'm there. And there was um, a situation that happened in 2016. We were on a trip into India, and we, we were um, going into jungle areas, man. I mean, they are back in the jungles of India where there's like elephants that will like kill you if you go at the wrong time of day. 
Yeah. But we were back in these jungle areas and, um, this day, this particular day, it had rained like crazy. And so our trails were like washed out and we had to take these long, long trail, long route around to where it would, you know, our, our shortcut would have been a lot easier when we had to take these other trails. Anyway, we wound up going to this, this, this village, a uh, Muslim village. Um, and they invited us in their house, their little hut area. And it was, you know, in, to get kind of an idea, it's not like they have a lot of rooms. I mean, they only have like maybe one room that's partitioned by blankets or maybe two rooms. And we go into this house and, you know, I'm sharing and, and, and ministering to them. And, and we were done. And, and the, the head of the house, he said, would you, you know, I'm being translated. They're not speaking. They're, they're speaking Hindi. Um, but he's like, would you pray for my daughter? And, and so I said, yeah, you know, and, and there's a guy with me named Kumar and he brought his daughter from around the corner and this girl, and like I said, I am skeptical and I've been a Christian for 21 years and, and I have never dealt with what I thought was possession of this trip. Okay. I see a lot of people doing a lot of flaky things. Um, but this, this girl comes around this corner and she looked like an animal caught in a trap. It was the weirdest thing. And she comes like, she was like down low, you know, coming at us and, and like she was trapped and confused and all this stuff. And I, in my mind, I'm thinking, I always try to think about, well, what, what kind of mental handicap could this be? Or what, what, what am I seeing here? Cause I've, you know, I've learned a lot about schizophrenia and stuff like that. But this girl, when I looked in her eyes, they were like soulless, man. That's the only way. They were just like soulless eyes and, and like she hated me. And so I've never in my life dealt with anything like this. Um, and I'm in the jungle thousands of miles from home. And so all I know to do is what I've read in the New Testament. And I just start casting it out in Jesus's name and just praying and this kind of stuff. And I remember doing that and Kumar's yelling in Hindi and, and all this stuff's going on. And then she kind of changed, you know, it's like she kind of, kind of straightened up. And, and I remember Kumar wasn't done yet. And so Kumar, um, like starts shouting at her in Hindi. And he asked the dad to go get a, a glass of water and grabs the water. And he, he just like, like puts a cross in it with his finger, you know, and blows on it. And then has her say something and he gives her a drink. And so I remember after that was over, I'm just like freaked out. You know, I'm like, what in the world is going on? And so after it was over, I, I asked Kumar, I said, what, what did you just do? And he basically told me, he said, um, he had to have her say Jesus is Lord. He had to have her say that because demonic forces will not, and they can't say that. And until she said that, he didn't feel like it was gone. And so the whole water thing, he said, you know, Indians are really into, um, the, the, um, into like uh, superstitious type stuff. And he said it was just part of what he had to do to cross the culture. Um, and then I mean, you see a lot of that around the world. I mean, we can't go to other parts of the world and say, we're bringing, you know, this to you and do it the way we do it. We have to, blend what they do, you know, in worship style or whatever. Um, but anyway, a couple of days later, we were, um, again, in the jungles, um, going through, um, from, from these different houses. And, um, this day was intense. This was a crazy day. Um, it started by us walking by this, um, house where there was like probably 50 people and they're wailing and it's, it's dusk. It's not quite, it's probably about an hour before dark and they're wailing and, and carrying on. And, and I'm just like, do are we stopping here? He said, no, we'll come back here. But what had happened there was a little, like a nine year old boy had died of, um, of typhoid. And so they were having kind of a funeral type dinner. Um, but we went on down and we got to this one place, um, um, where there was, um, probably about 50 people like sitting in this big circle, all right, probably probably 15 yards from me to the person, well, probably about 20 yards from me to the person, well, probably about 15, from me to that person. 
um, in front of me. And so there's quite a big circle with all these people. And we were ministering and, 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 and stuff like that. And then I, I asked, um, I asked uh, the, the leader that was there at the house through Kumar, I said, hey, ask him if there's anything we can pray for him for. And this guy from across the circle said, through translation, can you pray for my wife? And I said, sure, we can pray for your wife. What's wrong with your wife? And he said, she's mad. And I remember thinking, the first thought that came to mind, well, my wife's mad at me all the time, and I don't pray for her. And then I, I kind of laughed, and, and then he said back to Mark, he said, no, she's like like mad, like like crazy. And so as soon as he said that, this lady like jumped straight up in the air and like turned and took off running down this alley, like right in front of me, like ahead of me. And then she just like stopped. And it was literally like two things that grabbed her by each arm. It was the weirdest thing. It's like, it's like she just halted and turned around. And I remember her looking at me and came walking down that little, little, little alley between the two houses towards me. And she looked just like the girl before, two days before. I mean, just the same. Facial expressions were the same. Contortions to the face were the same. The eyes were soulless. And I remember her coming at me, and I, it was just a really freaky situation. But I remember thinking to myself, well, i got to be bold here. you know. And in my heart and in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm dealing with what I dealt with two days ago. And so anyway, we prayed, and, and it, we prayed for a while, and she was just kind of thrashing about. And finally, it was just like, it's not like a crazy exorcist movie type situation when you deal with stuff like that. It was just like it was done. And she was like back to normal. And everything was, was back. But here, and I believe with all my heart that, Man, something was jumping from person to person that that mm-hmm. were there, and and why? I don't know. I don't know, but I think it was the same um, dark type demonic spirit. I don't think it was the one that was, I was dealing with as a kid, but this was just a, a different part of the the, the uh, country, you know, or the world. Right. And it was it was a pretty intense situation. Yeah. You know, I was going to ask you about that to see if what you thought as far as whether you thought this was the same entity and two different people, or if just, you know, people that are possessed tend to act the same. Uh, but I do know, like, uh, one of the things that I tell people now, I don't have any experiences with demonic, uh, uh, exorcism, but, what I do tell people is when you are praying and you're casting something out, not to just cast it out and say, get out, but to tell it to yeah, go. It for something. Yeah. Like I, I tell people say, tell it to go where Jesus Christ tells you to go, because I don't mm-hmm. want the responsibility of this thing jumping from, you know, this person in front of me into their neighbor's house and, to, and, and, possessing that person's house because demons are looking for bodies to possess. And so they're going to like, just like in the Bible, you know, Jesus is doing his ministry and he casts out these demons uh, that are in one body, many demons, legion. And they asked him to go into the pigs, you know, like they Mm -hmm. want to possess bodies. And I have my own theories as to uh, where and why these things are so obsessed with possession of bodies, but, uh, never, nevertheless, I do believe that, you know, when you're casting these things out, not to just be like, get out, but say, go where Jesus tells you to go, let it in Jesus's hands. They just put it in Jesus's hands. Like here, Jesus do something with this because yeah. I don't know what to do. It's your job. No, Take a, care of it. You know that's what I mean? A real good point. Yeah. Cause I think of that other scripture that talks about when they cast them out, they, they go through arid places seeking, you know, a new place to go. And I don't know the exact scripture. That's just me paraphrasing. But that is a good point. Um, and Kumar was saying a lot of stuff in Hindi. So he may have been, you know, I was kind of taken by surprise. I, I'm going back here in the next 30 days. So I will definitely go read the scriptures and, and take that advice for sure.
This is Wes with Sasquatch Chronicles, and you're listening to The Confessionals with Tony Merkel. Do you get excited about going back now? I mean, knowing what you went through and what you experienced over there, uh, and knowing that the chances of you experiencing something like that again is is pretty legit. I mean, you've experienced it twice so far. Uh, do you get excited yeah. about the opportunity of going back, or is it something that you're excited, but you're also a little nervous and you know just not sure what's going to happen, like maybe a little unsettled? Um, man, I've been so many times. I, I really don't get super nervous anymore. That kind of stuff doesn't scare me or anything. Um, the, the, the things that scare me most about those situations is how remote we're at. We're so remote. There's no infrastructure. And if something goes down with one of the team members getting sick, it's going to be hard to get them out quick because it's just so far, but there's been times I've been sick and, and being sick more than anything worries me the rest of that stuff you know i just i don't worry about it because of my belief in in the power of god and what's in me now it doesn't like 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 stress me in any way um so not 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 much at all really is that the most current and recent thing that had happened you know with these uh possessions or is there anything else that you uh experienced over there um, as far as that goes, that that in India, there was a, another thing that happened in China one year. Um, we were um, we were going to this this Buddhist temple um, in China, and it was a temple that had been around for five thousand years. You know, it's been around forever. That's the, that's an old part of the world. I mean, people don't realize how old some of the, that history is in China, and you know. The, the 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 China whole dilemma. I mean, they they are communists and they do not want us coming there. I mean, we have right. to be very careful. But uh, we were going to this um, temple. We had a bunch of students. You know, we had Chinese students, American students, and we we're doing this cultural exchange type thing. So we were going to this temple one day. As we we're going to this temple, I start feeling like super. Um, intense sore throat, okay? Just came out of nowhere, like like fire. Like it was like burning in my throat. And immediately I started getting fearful because like I said a while ago, the thing that worries me the most is sickness happening to one of us because doctors, medical things in other parts of the world are not good at all compared to what we have here. And so, I, we're, anyway, we're going to this, this temple and I'm on this charter bus with all these people and as I got closer, it got more and more intense, and I started freaking out. I get inside. I'm, like, fearful, scared. Um, what's going to happen? I'm 10,000 miles from home. What if it's something serious? And Anyway, it was like, all of a sudden, I just felt like God was telling me, man, this is demonic. Just just pray. Pray for healing. Pray pray, pray that you'll be fine in, in the name of Jesus, and, and you're dealing with something demonic. And so I remember I just prayed. And as I prayed, it just, it just went away. And I remember when I come off that bus, I thought to myself, it was like, I'm thinking, we're going to a place that Americans probably have never been, Christians have never been at all. And so something didn't want us there, and it was attacking. And I remember we got off that, that, that bus, and I remember I thought to myself, I'm just going to say Jesus everywhere I went. I'm just going to say that. I'm not going to pray. I'm just going to say that name. And in my mind, I was thinking everything's like fleeing, you know, when I'm saying this name. Yeah. And I remember there was a, a family that were doing blessings for their baby, a Chinese family. And there was a monk, a Buddhist monk, like performing some ceremony with like um, incense and rattles and all kinds of stuff. But man, this guy, the way he was gyrating and, and convulsing. It looked like he was possessed. Now, I don't know that for a fact, but it was a freaky scene watching him perform this blessing over this little baby, um, the way he was just doing it. It just looked like it was something demonic, in my opinion, too. But I've seen things like that happen. It's more of the oppression you feel when you're in other parts of the world. Man, it's just, there's things that have been there for millennia, like kingdoms. And they don't want you messing with it, you know. They've controlled and controlled those people, and they do not want you 
messing up what they have. And I think that's why you see some of this miraculous stuff happen, like in Africa and, and China and India, that I don't see happen here. Because you're on like the front lines when you're out there, you know? You're like like the Book of Acts type stuff. You're like trusting that what you see in Scripture is really going to happen in front of you because that's all you got, you know? And so you're absolutely right. That does happen out there. Yeah. So. You know, Scott, I'll tell you, man, and this kind of falls right into uh, something that I keep getting emails from people about telling me how wrong I am. But <laughs> until, until somebody really proves to me how wrong I am, I'm going to keep saying it. Uh, yeah. You know, in America, we've stripped out the supernatural. We stripped out God from our society and we stripped out his supernatural aspects. Now God is just a trophy that we put on the shelf and that shelf collects dust along with that trophy and we pick it up every once in a while to admire it, but it holds no value to us. And Amen. You know, when it comes to these other countries, it's very real. Spiritual warfare yeah. is very real. And it's not yeah. like it's something where they, they, uh, it, it's, it's part of their life. It, it's something that, you know, they, it's not, it's like they take super, uh, supernatural, uh, spiritual warfare and things like that. They actually take it for granted as something that's just part of life. It's not, crazy yeah. like out of the ordinary for them this is something that is just straight up every day this is part of life but here mm -hmm. uh I, I think we've been really um blinded to you know the paranormal supernatural aspects of life we've been put we put on these blinders with our culture and we want to pretend that none of that's real and when people say that they experience these things, they're just the crazy guys. They're, they saw, th they're just seeing things. They probably should get on some medications. Let's just give them some yeah. more pills. They just, it, just give them some more medication. It'll all go away. And that's a problem. Yeah. That's a real problem. We're, we're, we're drugging up people and stuff who say that they are seeing things. And I'm, I'm sure there are people out there who are straight up crazy and they need to be on yeah. medication. But I, yeah. I, I, I've heard some stories of people who have seen things, dramatic things, and they've been put into mental institutions because they were told they were crazy, only to, you know, six months later be released, stop taking their medicine. They're fine. Their situation changed after they got out of the out of the hospital or something like that. And they're not seeing these things anymore. But they're not on the medication. Like, like they they're not crazy. Like I'm thinking, yeah. I, I know I'm talking in circles here, but I'm thinking of one story where uh, a guy had been released from the mental institution, but in that period of time, his dad moved. And so he's living in another place. And now that he's in this other place, all activity stopped. It's done. It's over. Yeah. It was left behind the other place. He's not, he wasn't yeah. crazy, but they don't have yeah. any other way to explain it other than you're crazy and you need to be put in a mental institution, be heavily sedated, and that will solve all your problems. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's like in the South, you know, that's where I'm at. Man, this is stuff you don't even talk about in church. You know, you don't even, yeah. you don't even acknowledge it. And like the demonic and, and, and some of this stuff I'm talking about. But there's something real going on. You know what I mean? We, we need to confront it. And we need to realize that some people do have a gift of discernment. There is still supernatural things. God is supernatural, you know? And it's like one of those things where, like you said, we, he, here's the problem. We're all consumers. That's what we are in America. We're consumers. We have more than we can even imagine. You go to the places I go to, I mean, we're praising and worshiping, and there's like goats and a uh, guitar with three strings. And those people are just enjoying and are blessed beyond what we are in our smoke-filled, you know, light show type concert atmospheres. And we've stripped it all down. We've, we've, we've numbed it to where it's a show. And you're right. The supernatural is gone. Why do I need to rely on anything? Because I can, you know, people think they can control everything, but like, like when we're there, you can't control, yeah. you know, I can't control if I'm, I, I've been super sick in India to the point where I thought I was dying and I couldn't control that, man. And I remember the peace I felt in the midst of those situations thinking, you know, it's almost like you feel so close to God in those situations. I've heard stories where people are about to get executed and some of their friends around them are getting executed. 
And then they come back home, they make it through that situation, and they always say to each other, I wish we were back there because I felt so close. And there's been times where I've been in other parts of the world, and that's how I felt. I mean, being sick and feeling like I was dying and, and then knowing, you know, all I got is God. And so there's a supernatural aspect that happens, and that's one of the things that excites me about going back to those places. So, Yeah, that's kind of cool, man. I mean, like— you know, I was raised in a Christian church and I've had opportunities to go on mission trips. I'd never been on a missions trip. Uh, it just never really uh, developed for me. But I hear a lot of people yeah. come back and say a lot of similar things that you're saying right now, that it's just like you feel more alive and you, and the, the culture change and the reality of, you know, not just the supernatural, but the reality of what the world is outside of America. I mean, forget forget the supernatural, forget the paranormal, forget everything we just talked about for the last hour. Just the fact that you take yourself outside the American culture and society and put yourself into another culture, all of a sudden you realize how good you got it in this country. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. like, oh, like that, we got it good. That, and so, go ahead, I'm sorry. That, that's the thing that changes people. Because you're right. I mean, we go to China, which is the most populated nation in the world, and then India, which is second. But India is going to be number one probably in the next 20 years. And the poverty that you experience in India, we don't even have a – there's 300 and some million Americans. There's like one point some billion Indian. We don't even remotely know how poor, how rich we are, even the poorest here have so much more than probably 98% of the world population. So we really are, and I don't want to make anybody feel bad, but we really are living in a dream world here in America because you go outside the border and there's a lot of suffering and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of stuff happening. Um, right. That we just can't comprehend. And, and I wrestle with that. You know, I wrestle with that when I come home. Why am I so blessed to be here? You know, and it's, it's, it's a struggle, but, I don't put that on other people. Like I don't come home and say, everybody needs to go on mission trips, you know, because they haven't experienced <laughs> it yet. You know what I mean? They haven't experienced it yet. I can't put that burden on them um, because yeah. I've seen it. You know, I just try to uh, help people realize that literally we're living <laughs> in a dream world here in America, man. I, I can't even explain how much when you see, you know, naked little kids in the train stations of India, dirty and filthy and, you know, poor mom trying to raise him the bed. It's just a sad, sad situation. So, yeah, it's it's on a whole nother level when it comes to going to another country. I mean, like we have poor people here in this country. We have homeless in this country, but it's different when you go to a third world country and everybody is homeless. Everybody's living like the worst homeless person here in in this country. You know what I mean? It's just it's on mm-hmm. a different level. Yeah, I mean, people are literally when you go to like Delhi. I don't know if you've heard last summer, the summer before, I mean, it got like record breaking temperatures. People are literally dying in the streets of the heat. I mean, just mass, you know, it's just a, it's just a sad situation. And there were probably older homeless people or, you know, little, little kids that are homeless or something, but it's just, it is devastating, but we just do what we got to do to try to help them. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I wanted to ask you a couple things here about, you know, just one of the things about your mom, but before we get to your mom, I wanted to bring up this point that earlier in the interview, you said that it got to the point where uh, you knew that, uh, you know, somebody was, I think you said somebody was going to call before they called or you knew the answers before they were given on the Ouija board. Uh, And it, it reminds me just of, uh, me personally, actually, I, I don't have, I never had control over this and it happened a lot more when I was a kid. In fact, I can't remember it ever happening as an adult, but there was times when I was a kid that I just had this sense that something was going to happen. And then it happened. And it got to the point where I remember the one time I, you know, got some confidence going and stuff. And when I felt this feeling, I was going to act on it. And so we're sitting in the living room and I really felt the phone was going to ring. So I just stood up from the couch. I walked over to the counter where the phone was and I reached out my hand before it even rang. And just as I was about to pick it up, it started ringing. And I just, in in one motion, picked it up answered it, gave it to my mom because it was for my mom. I turned around and my dad, uh, he he looks at me, he's like, did you know that was going to ring? And I'm like, uh, yeah, or something like that. I can't remember exactly what I said yeah. and stuff, but I remember my dad looking yeah. at me saying, did you know that was going to ring? 
<laughs> yeah. But he never talked to me about it before that. And I, I know my dad listens to the podcast. So when he hears this and stuff, he's probably either going to say, I don't remember that at all. Or he's going to be like, yep, totally remember that. <laughs> it freaked yeah. me out. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. That stuff happens to me still. I mean, it still does not in a weird, dark way. But, you know, somebody will call or I'll be thinking of somebody. I'll be talking to my wife about that person. And then they call or whatever the situation. So, yeah, that happens to me a lot, too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you about your mom. Uh, you, you started off with that whole story of your childhood and your mother and everything, but you really didn't kind of tell me, like, do you know how she got involved in the occult? Like, do you, do you know, like what the process was for her? To, or was it something that she was raised in? Do you know anything about that? No, not really. To be honest with you, that's a good question. I've never asked her that. I would think it probably... I would think it probably has something to do with my grandma. Um, just because I remember a story my mom told me about, um, two stories, actually, my, uh, my, uh, my grandpa, my, my mom's dad died in like 69 before I was even born. But I remember my mom told me a story about how, um, after he had died, uh, my grandma told her, told my mom that she had a dream that she was walking down the street um, towards the cemetery where my grandpa was buried. And, um, she said he was walking down the street and, and, and he hugged her and basically told her, he said, there's a lot of stuff you don't understand now. And, and, but you'll understand someday. And she said she woke up that morning, like he was in bed with her, like he was hugging her. You know what I mean? And so I remember my mom telling me that story, but I also remember my mom told me another story about how one one of her brothers who was older than her was sick. Um, this was probably in the forties and my grandma was in the room um, and it was nighttime and they put him in a little, uh, like a laundry basket type deal, the baby um, to sleep. And um, she put him in that laundry basket. And he, had, like I said, he had been sick as a child. And that night she said, she saw a, um, like a blue glowing misty light, like over, um, that little area where, where my uncle was as a baby. And at that moment, she realized that he would be fine. She never worried about him being sick later on. Now I say that because both those stories were filtered from my grandma to my mom, to me. So maybe it was something that started like back with my um, grandma. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of where it might lead to just because of those stories coming through, through my mom from her. So, um, and my mom, like I said earlier, she wasn't into like, it was the Ouija board and it was mainly just dabbling in like going to psychics and tarot card readers and things like that. Um, she wasn't like crazy into the occult. I just think she opened up a door for me that that wasn't good or she, I, she, I kind of, um, it's, it's, it's not like she ingrained me into it. I just watched it. And I followed. I got you. You know, with, yeah. with this room that you guys found, uh, I think you described it as under the house. Now you described it as there are stairs going down. Was yeah under the when house you, when you dis, when you discovered all this, the stairs were included in the discovery. You didn't even know there was stairs there. The whole time we lived in that house till two thousand three, when we ripped up that floor, we had no idea because this was the house was over this area, and so we didn't know that whole time that that room was under there. Now, it makes sense that it was where it was at because the one-room shack would have, it would have probably been on the back of that one-room shack, like almost like a cellar or a root, you know, like they call them root cellars where they put potatoes or whatever and they'd stay good underground. But, um, man, I don't know. It was weird. I remember when we dug the, when we tore that floor out and saw that, it was just like, what in the world? Are you serious? This has been here for, you know, for, for the last 20 years we lived there, we had no idea. And they just floored it back up <laughs> and moved out. That's what they did. They just picked wow. the floor up. So. Did you get any pictures of it? 
No, we didn't get any pictures. Oh man, I would have died to see that. I would have died to see it. I mean, what yeah. what you're describing, I just it's so mysterious and and I just I just want to see it. I want to go in it. I want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know who owns that house now. I I drive by there all the time, but um I don't know, man. It's it's there. Would you ever that, consider that going room. would you ever consider going up to the people that live there now and telling them it's there? probably be furious that we never you know i don't i don't i don't know i don't know oh yeah because that might be some kind of buyer's disclosure well and it wasn't my house (laughs) it wasn't (laughs) me the one that did that so but yeah you're probably right but still one of these days when i'm i'm rich maybe i'll buy it just for the heck of it (laughs) it's not a super expensive house it's probably worth about i don't know 60 to eighty thousand dollars over there in that part of tulsa so um, wow but it'd be cool to buy it. It would make a great storm shelter here in Oklahoma. We have tornadoes. And if you put a little hatch door there, you can go right down to that area and be, be cool. You know, during the tornado. Do you so, think that, do you think that might've been what it was originally intended for? No, I think it was a, a seller. Like when it was that one room shack, it was, the house was built around over the decade. Like rooms were added. A roof was added over. I mean, you could look in that attic and see the old roof. And then you'd see the new roof above it. Like, it was crazy. And you see a little chimney coming out of that old roof. And I just think it was like a like a basement to that old house, you know. I don't know, man. I don't, I don't know. It was just a, a weird. That's the only thing I could come up with. Because it didn't look like it was any part of any sewer system, you know. Like, it was an old sewer system or something. Because it was just stairs that led to this room it wasn't like there was pipes going in in any direction you know, underneath the house so it was pretty weird though if you were to uh have access to the house for one day would you easily be able to access that or is that completely shut off now covered up you can't access it unless you tear up flooring well you could probably go through a uh if there's still a opening in a crawl space, but I don't know, you know, going underneath houses like that, sometimes um dirt collects to where you can't get over certain mounds of dirt, you know. Um we had plumbers under that house over the years and nobody ever saw it. And so it was more there's an access to um I think it's the south side of the house on the side, because it was crawl space, like I said. And it was probably a good, golly, I don't know, 10 yards, 15 yards to where that room was underneath the house. It was almost like, almost center. I mean, it was almost like in the center of the house. But you'd have to dig underneath or tear the floor out. There's no other way to get there, except for through that one access side on the side or digging through the uh, floor, tearing the floor out again. And I'm not, I'm not planning on crawling. <laughs> That's nasty, man. Underneath those houses. Yeah, uh, no, I'm, I'm sure it is. They, but anyway, it was, it was pretty weird. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, that, that'd be so creepy. I mean, if, you know, I found that underneath my house, I'd be like, what the heck? Like, <laughs> no wonder I've been seeing the shadow figures in the house. <laughs> no wonder why this? I'm waking up with scratches yeah. on my body. No figure. <laughs> There's a room underneath that house. Oh, I see really dead people crazy. for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it was, it was insane. Wow. Yeah. Well, Scott, listen, man, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing these stories tonight and stuff. It's been fascinating and uh, definitely a pleasure of mine, man. I appreciate it a lot. No problem, man. I appreciate you having me. For sure, man. Take care. All right. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, there are three things you can do to help support the show. One, you can go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review. Two, you can go to patreon.com forward slash the confessionals. That's patreon.com forward slash the confessionals and become a patron. Or three, and this is for free. You can highlight the link to the show that you're listening to right now and share it around social media. That would help me out a great deal as well. And until next week, stay safe, take care, and remember... The truth will set you free, but first, it will piss you off. Bye.